Taylor Wallace, thank you for joining me today on Acquiring Minds. It's good to be here. Excited to uh, spend some time with you today. Taylor, you have been in tech, you've been nomadic, and today you run two doggy daycares in Tampa, both of which you acquired. I've spent time in tech myself, so I love hearing stories about people who found ETA in small business via tech. So we're going to really get into that piece of this. But um, start us off, Taylor, wherever you think. Well, actually, why don't you start us off in our pre-call? You had told me how um, in college, at least, you were the least, the, you know, business seemed like the least likely thing you might end up doing. Um, and yet here you are. So um, start us there if you think that would, uh, is, a good, is a good place to do so. Yeah, I mean, I think probably 15, 16, you're trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. And uh, I was a book nerd as a kid. I, I love novels. Um, and uh, in my high school, we, we had sort of the opportunity to specialize towards our last few years there. So I, I really kind of stopped taking math and science classes and was focused on kind of literature, philosophy and language and um, wanted to study literature in college. And my dad basically said over my dead body, he's a CPA turned uh, entrepreneur and was like, you're going to study business. And, um, you know, eventually I won and, and, and uh, I went to the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and studied literature there and, um, you know, spent four years with in. I think, I think eventually he won Taylor, by well, the way. Yeah, eventually. Uh, <laughs> eventually, yeah. eventually, eventually, yeah, I think, right. I think we compromised. Uh, we uh, definitely have very different approaches, I think, to business today based on uh, our, our backgrounds. But um, yeah, so, ah, so went to, um, went to the University of St. Andrews and, and uh, in the UK, the, the college experience uh, educationally is quite different where you hyper-specialize early on. Uh, so I took three classes the entire time I was in college. I took English, German, and philosophy. Um, so I've never had an accounting class. I, I think I took one management class as an elective. Um, and we, sold, we started a t-shirt company naturally. Uh, and towards the end of my time there, I got pretty involved in, uh, theatrical production. So I was like putting, producing plays, um, and that combined with a sci-fi class, which really kind of got me thinking about the future and, and, uh, working with teams and, and, and thinking, you know, do I really want to like sit in a cabin in the woods and write books for the rest of my life? Or do I want to kind of figure out, uh, ways to work with groups of people and, um, invent the future. I, I, I sort of started to become fascinated with the idea of the internet and the power of storytelling on the internet and, and what could that look like? And, uh, I wasn't one of these guys that was, was very internet savvy in college. I mean, I, I knew how to use Facebook and, you know, could work my way around Google, but, uh, had no real foundational understanding of, of, of tech or, or, or software. Um, so I just kind of tried to find the first startup that would hire me right out of school. And, and I landed, uh, in New York city working for an ad tech company there. Uh, it was like maybe 15 people in a windowless office in, in lower Manhattan. And, um, you know, that was kind of a trial by fire of really just like learning how the internet worked. Uh, and it was, it was an awesome experience because within a couple of months, I'm, I'm going into Google's office and Yahoo and, uh, we were a, a, a data management platform. So we sort of had hooks and all these interesting ad tech players in the space. And, um, I, 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 what year is this now, Taylor? 2011 to 2012. Okay. Um, so yeah, spent a year doing that. And I, I was fascinated by tech. I really didn't love ad tech. Um, I, I thought sort of the way that the internet was monetized was interesting, but it was, it was a bit soul crushing of just like trying to move data from point A to B so we could better <laughs> target ads was like, you know, this isn't really my, my reason to be, um, so after about a year there, I was kind of looking like, okay, how do I, how do I move into something a little bit more creative? And, and, um, I was actually approached by my uncle and my cousin, um, and my uncle's a tech entrepreneur and, and they had this idea for uh, a mobile app. Um, and my cousin was still in school and my uncle was running another company and they were like, we want to do this and we need somebody that can kind of like be the first guy, uh, in the trenches. So I left that job. Um, and we started building, uh, what was at the time like a photo and video sharing app for events. Um, a bunch of products kind of tried to tackle this. I mean, Apple's basically solved the problem now with, with shared albums. But at the time, I mean, Instagram had kind of just launched. Um, hashtags on Instagram weren't a thing yet. So like going to a concert or a sporting event and like trying to find all that content, you'd see like a million phones in the air and and uh, you really couldn't, you couldn't pull together like your friends' pictures and videos very easily. So we, we sort of started trying to tackle that uh, that problem and eventually moved down to Tampa. We were working with a development shop here 
Um, and, uh, spent, yeah, like two and a half years raised, raised about a million dollars, um, kind of building out prototypes, trying to get that, get that to, you know, go viral. Like that was our goal at the time was, you know, you were seeing these crazy valuations for, for Snapchat and WhatsApp and, you know, it was sort of like the, the heyday of, of trying to build a consumer product, uh, that would go viral and you'd mm-hmm. get a bunch of funding. And, and, um, eventually we got to a point where we're like, okay, that's, this probably isn't a good business plan. Um, so we pivoted into, uh, building an enterprise pot product that was, uh, very akin to Slack for photo and video content around corporate culture. Um, so we would do things like, uh, video in intros for new hires. Like you'd, you'd join a company and you'd make this like mashed up video of yeah. who you were and that'd get shared out with your team and, uh, recruiting events. And we'd build out these like cool landing pages for corporate culture that was all crowdsourced content from their teams. Um, I did a little bit better with that, you know, started generating some real revenue and raised, raised some more money and, and spent another kind of two and a half years on that. Um, and we got to a point where it just like, it wasn't hockey sticking. Um, and we kind of sat down as a team and we're like, Hey, are we going to, you know, continue to pour money and time into this? And at this point, you know, my, my partner and I had spent five years on it. Um, and we were just, I think, burnt out and, and kind of ready to do something different. Um, so that was 2017. Um, and I'm 27 years old. I have done really nothing but this for most of my career. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out now, like, what, what do I do now? And that's, that's a recurring theme in my life. I, I tend to have these moments of like, after college, like, what do I do now? And, and after, after the startup, like what's next? And, uh, I, I went to a friend's wedding in Siberia and was like, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, I want to do that more. Um, so I started kind of thinking about how to get, what, what's that just travel get I, like, married in Siberia? No, go to weddings ah. in Siberia. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I wanted to figure out how I could kind of travel and work. Um, I was simultaneously, I was applying for like product manager jobs at Google, which apparently are really hard to get. Um, and, uh, just the big company thing, like wasn't really resonating with me at the time. So I, I found a small, um, tech focused investor relations firm that needed like a head of comms marketing guy part-time um and they were distributed so i was like you know if i if i work for you guys can i be in berlin and they said yes so i I bought a one-way ticket to berlin um and for the next kind of three years i basically proceeded to just chase consulting gigs all over the world um and went from berlin to israel to jackson hole wyoming to la san francisco miami um and can kind of elaborate on any of those pit stops along the way, if you'd like. Well, um, we'll probably touch on them. You just named a couple of my favorite cities. Um, but what, so, but, but to take us up to the decision then to stop being a nomadic consultant and actually go, um, get into small business. Yeah. So the last kind of, my line was always, I'd be in these job interviews and they'd, they'd ask me, you know, how soon can you move to San Francisco or Miami? And I'd be like, well, I can move in 48 hours. And they'd be like 48 hours. I'm like, my whole life is in a suitcase. Like if you pay me this amount of money, I will be there in two days. Um, so the last company to, to hire me to, to move was uh, Magic Leap in Miami, which is a big, you know, multi-billion dollar funded AR startup. Um, and uh, so I moved to Miami in uh, 2019 and uh, I was sort of like feeling it out. My, my sort of MO at that point had been like six months to a year somewhere and then I'm, I'm gone. Um, and uh, I spent about a year there and was like, okay, this is interesting. Um, the company was very chaotic, but the tech was really fascinating. It was the biggest company I'd ever worked for. I had about 2000 employees. Um, and uh in February, I was like, I'm leasing an apartment for a year for the first time in years, and I'm going to buy a bed. And this is February 2020. Um, so within a month, the whole city locks down, you can't go outside. Um, and the first month into the pandemic, uh, magically, basically fired everyone except core engineering. So I'm sitting in this like beautiful apartment in Miami with my new bed, um, and no job. And I don't really know many people in Miami, and I can't go outside anyway. Um, so I started, I have a lot of family in Tampa. So I started kind of coming up here just so I had people to see in, in the early days of COVID. Um, and uh, I reconnected with uh, my former roommate who ran a doggy daycare. And we had sort of spitballed for years over over uh, this idea of doing a doggy daycare together. And 
Um, simultaneously, I was getting recruited by a private equity firm in the pet tech space. Um, so that sort of got my wheel spinning on like, you know, what's this pet space really all about? And um, started kind of diving into just researching the pet space and got pretty excited about the the idea of doing something in it. And and then my 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 former roommate and I said, hey, like, let's let's do a doggy daycare. And, and we started looking for an entry point. And that was the summer of uh, 2020. Interesting. So you, unlike many of my guests, did not learn about ETA or the buy and build model and then go out and say, what what categories, what industries do I want to buy a business in? You were going to do something in pet and you were looking for an entry point and ETA, buy and build ended up being that entry point. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I like, again, I've probably worked for over a hundred startups. So the idea of like starting up didn't scare me at all. Um, and, and really our search kind of initially, and I say search, meaning like our search for an entry point, um, started at the franchise level. My, my partner worked for one of the big franchise players in the space. So we explored potentially just buying a, a territory in that franchise system. We explored potentially buying out his, his owner that he worked for. Um, and then we looked at a couple other franchise systems and we had this kind of interesting disagreement where he would see a franchise system and love the, the operation side of it. And I would hate the marketing. And we'd see another one where I would love the marketing and kind of the business side and who the franchisees were, and he would hate the operations. So we couldn't find a system that we both agreed on. Um, and, and the more that we looked at these, these franchises, we, the more we felt like we could, we sort of had all the pieces. It was like, he knows how to work with dogs and to run a facility. And I know how to raise money and how to sell and market. Um, so maybe we should do this on our own. So we, we were sort of coming around to the idea of just starting up on our own. Yeah. Um, when we found an independent for sale, just kind of like fell in our lap. Um, and it checked a lot of the boxes and, and, uh, we ran it by, uh, you know, some of our, our advisors and potential investors. And they were like, yeah, it's a lot easier to buy something than it is to build it from scratch. So this might be a good entry point for you guys. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't even know what search or ETA were probably until six months after I did it. Mm -hmm. And so now, but now I, you know, I see your post on, on LinkedIn, you're active with Baton. Dylan is actually who introduced us. Um, so you're actually quite a believer and an evangelist uh, in of ETA. So I assume you've read yeah, the books. Yeah, total, con total and so convert. On. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, I've gone from, again, spending the first 10 years of my career really working at startups that were, um, for all intents and purposes, chasing product market fit. Um, yep. You know, even Magic Leap has raised $4 billion, I think, at this point. Like, they don't have product market fit yet. Um, the, the startup I worked on for, for five years was, was, that was really what we were doing was, was trying to create something that, that had a market and, um, through ETA, it's like you, you step into product market fit. It's already there. Um, so it's, it's a very different, um, I think experience as an entrepreneur to try to invent something versus try to optimize and grow something. Um, and I, and I think without realizing it, like I always really wanted to optimize and grow something. Um, and, and that's what I've sort of found through ATA now is that, that if, if that's where you want to focus your energy, if you're, if you don't want to be an inventor and you want to be a true operator and, 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 and uh, someone focused on growth, like ETA is an awesome path. Yeah, no, you, you, I couldn't have said it better myself and, and coming from tech and having kind of started my own ideas that, you know, floundered, never really went anywhere, um, worked with others who have gone through the same pain. Um, there it, it, it's one of the things that I think for those of us who have experienced that or come from tech that is so magical about ETA is this whole giant question in tech is, you know, the, the Y Combinator question, build something people want that's answered. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you're already doing, you know, th there's already product market fit. Now, it, you know, we could get into the weeds about, about what tech defined product market fit is. And th they're talking about something with enormous traction and growth potential. And um, obviously, a lot of kind of small businesses, ETA businesses are not that. But you do still the point remains that you're looking at buying businesses that have people who are you that have are providing a service or a product that people want, they're paying you for. And it's just, um, that is such a precious and elusive quality <laughs> in tech. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think, that, I mean, you, you know, you and I really, really appreciate that fact. Well, I, I think the thing that's so interesting and like one of the things I try to talk to people, because I'm like the biggest evangelist for people in tech that are like, what do I do with my life? And I'm, I'm over tech. I'm like, go buy a small business. Um, is, <laughs> you know, you, you, I saw a tweet today that, that was like, you know, if, if you uh, if you want to buy a small business, like find a business that uh, still uses a fax machine and do that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's this I idea of like, by, yeah, like by coming in with with 
you know, very basic processes that, that are kind of second nature to someone who spent a lot of time in technology, you know, bring in a best in class CRM, thinking about marketing automation, um, you know, applying like OKRs or KPIs to a business and, and, and bringing in a book like traction or something is like most small business owners haven't done that. Um, so you can, you can very quickly grow, uh, an acquisition by, by sort of implementing things that feel like table stakes in, in tech companies. Well, let's um, let's drill into that a little bit because that is kind of the um, the, the key pitch. What, what you just said, like layer in normal best practices stuff from tech, the tech industry or more sophisticated industries into an old fax machine business. Um, but I do feel like that can be oversold. Uh, that it's not always. First of all, small many of these small businesses out there are not as unsophisticated as all that. Um, they, you know, they, they have the reputation for the fax machine, but, you know, let's give these boomers some credit. You know, they're using email, they're using, <laughs> they have websites, they, many of them know what SEO is. So I, I do feel like that can be a little bit oversold. You only can speak to your own business experience, but on this point, what have you found? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple pillars, right? And like, one is that, is just sort of best in class, like marketing and, 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 operational efficiency um that that you often see in tech startups that involve systems and 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 systems thinking um but i think the other piece of this that we've really found is uh especially for smb is like customer service right is mm. is uh we really emphasize uh putting the customer first uh customer almost always being right um trying to build a staff that really thinks that way building a culture then that is is very customer centric um, and I think that, uh, that can get a bit lost sometimes with existing small business operators, right. Of, of, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I could point to a why, but it, we've all used, you know, lawn services companies, et cetera, that, um, are either too small that they don't care or too big that they don't care. And I think we're really trying to hit that, that niche of like, we can be a growing, um, large scale company, but at the same time really have this culture of like customer first, um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think sort of pulling interesting financial levers as well, centered around growth, like that's really what we're trying to do now. Um, a lot of the small business uh, owner operators that we talk to, like potentially want to grow, but they don't really know how to either raise money um, or or uh, get financially creative to, to, to really kind of pour gas in the fire of the thing that they've created. So I think we bring that to the equation as well, that, um, you know, if you come from sort of the VC world at all, um, I, we talked to a ton of people that, that we could raise money from, um, just because of the way that we've approached it and sort of how we're thinking about it. So I think that's another asset that, that, uh, people kind of overlook is, is, you know, you can, you can arbitrage multiples, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that we're thinking about. Well, what, one of the other things that you'd said in our pre-call, um, that you think your tech experience gives you, um, gives you an advantage in is your ambition, um, that you, you, you come from an industry that thinks big. Uh, and, and maybe a lot of kind of s traditional small businesses don't think as big, um, and just kind of shooting for the stars, uh, you know, that, that sort of ambition can really pull more out of a bit that ambition alone can sometimes pull more out of a business than, 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 than otherwise. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's funny. My partner and I, I mean, so we've done two acquisitions in the last really two years, um, and we're currently building our first greenfield. So, you know, hopefully we'll have three under the belt in three years and, and we're actively trying to acquire at least two more. Um, and we're constantly like, how can we be doing more? And we had the conversation last week of like, objectively, we've done a lot. And, uh, when we tell anyone else that we've done two and, and, and sort of what we've managed to build in the last two years, like everyone's like, wow, that's, that's phenomenal. And we're sort of really hungry to be doing more. Um, and I think that's juxtaposed with this idea that, that I really came into SMB with was that like, I was tired of trying to get astronauts to the moon. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, most of these tech startups I've worked at have been like, we're going to change the world with our widget. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I got a little burnt out on sort of that, like endless optimism without a lot of actual impact. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we got into this, it was like, let's try to build something really big, but at the same time, like that's very impactful on the individual and the local level. Um, so in, instead of kind of trying to grow for the sake of growth, it's like, let's grow in a way that like we can have 
um, great jobs for our employees, that we can provide a great service for our customers, that we can build a sustainable lifestyle for ourselves so that we're not working 120 hours a week. Um, and, uh, you know, people ask us all the time, like, you know, what's your exit strategy and, you know, where, where do you want to be in five years? And, uh, for the first time in my life, I'm like, I don't really care. Like I'm really focused on like the next two years and how do we build a really great company? Um, and I think if we can do that, like the, the end result will, will, will net out to be awesome. Mm -hmm. that, that's awesome. Taylor, man, you're all this, your, your response to the world of tech is really um, speaking my language, uh, in, in your draw to ETA, the, um, when you, uh, talk to people in tech who say, what should I do with my life or how should I pivot my career? And you tell them about buying a small business, do they, do their eyes light up or do they, um, have what I would kind of consider the normal tech person reaction, which is that's, that's two small potatoes. That's not, you know, that's, that's not, in line with the, you know, the tech perspective of the world, that it's got to be about putting a dent in the universe. It's got to be about putting astronauts on Mars. Um, uh, uh, yeah. How, how well received is your message? Because it was a process for you. You had to kind of burn out yeah. on tech probably to arrive at where you're at now. And if somebody is, is pre burnout, um, they probably, you know, we, we know how tech is. They probably don't think doggy daycares are as cool as AR technology. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I was the when we did our first acquisition, uh, I came on half time when we had the first facility um, and I was spending the other half of my time consulting for a VC fund. Um, and it kind of became clear to me when we were thinking about buying a second, like, OK, I'm either going to be a VC or I'm going to I'm going to run doggy daycares. Um, so I kind of had to make that that decision even after we've made the first acquisition. And um, uh, the feedback is very mixed. Right. And I think as as you're asking me the question, I'm processing it as like you talk to someone who's early in their career and like super starry eyed still. And they're like, why are you playing with dogs? Like you have all this tech experience, like you should be, you know, working at Google or whatever. Um, right. You talk to someone that is kind of where I was at, where they've worked for a bunch of different startups and maybe haven't had a home run and they're all like, that's awesome. How do I do this? Right. <laughs> a, I think there's a definitely like, like for lack of a better word, like a middle manager class of, of tech worker that, um, you know, was sort of promised the, 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 you know, billion dollar exit that was going to set them up forever that, that, uh, really just became, a, you know, a, a high paid employee over the last 10 years, maybe jumped around a bit. And I think, I think that's burning a lot of people out. Right. Um, and I think many of them are sort of exploring ways they can do something different and, and, you know, don't just continue working for startups for the rest of their career. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you talk to a lot of the sort of more seasoned, like the, the partners at the VC fund, et cetera. Um, and I think most of them, uh, many of them really get it. Uh, they, they're like, you know, you can be excited about any business. And, and the one that we chose was tech. Um, and, you know, if you're excited about this, I mean, there's, there's no reason you can't grow this to be something huge. And, um, you know, I think there's a bit of wisdom there as well that kind of comes into play that you don't see in sort of the two younger audiences of, of, uh, of you know, go do something that makes you happy and that, that impacts others and, and uh you know, be smart about it financially and, and you can make it work. You know, that's so interesting. I That's counterintuitive to me. I would not have guessed that the VCs are the ones that kind of have the wise response to you. Because my impression always was, you know, that kind of the, the phrase lifestyle business, which, you know, in Silicon Valley is kind of said with a bit of a sneer. My, my impression was always that like the, the VCs were kind of the the ones to introduce the, the idea of a lifestyle business being you know, not interesting. Um, and that it just kind of trickled down through the rest of the tech industry. So, so anyway, interesting to hear that in fact, the VCs are, have a more enlightened view about business and kind of say, you know, choose your business and go after your business. Could be tech, could be doggy daycares. Yeah. I mean, it's like, we work with, um, uh, we, I don't work with him, but he's, he's a customer and a friend and a, an investor in my former startup. Um, and he's leading, he's the CEO now of a you know multi-billion dollar SaaS company. And, and, um, he also runs a uh, a nonprofit that's focused on uh, uh, mentoring kids through their careers, um, and he's like, "Let's start a fund and you know fund uh, uh, blue collar companies." And I'm like, "People people do that. Like, that's the thing." He's like, "Really? Like I, I I think that's awesome." And it's it's you know I think his experience has been like he's been in tech his entire career. He's 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 probably in his fifties, um, and I think he's seen such a massive gap. Um, in what great small business can provide in terms of jobs and, and re community resources and, and, um, 
you know, I think a lot of sort of intelligent investors have seen that over their career and how, you know, yeah, software is eating the world, but maybe that's not the best thing. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Great. So interesting. Well, um, I want to stay on kind of these philosophical topics for a second. The other big contrast in your life decision here to buy the doggy daycares is going from nomadic bachelor who doesn't own a bed to, <laughs> to a guy who owns very physical, very IRL, very brick and mortary um, businesses. Um, I don't say lifestyle business in the sense that, oh, it affords a certain lifestyle. I mean, this, this di really dictates your lifestyle and really force you to to commit to, to location. Um, I, I went through a phase of digital nomadism way back, uh, and loved it. Um, but it ran its course. Anyway, how do you, t t how do you feel about like incredible geographic freedom to, um, really not to scare you, but to but really being anchored in Tampa? I mean, I'm sure you've thought about this already, but to really being truly yeah, anchored yeah. to one place. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely like part of my logic in initially making the decision, uh, was I was pretty burnt out on digital nomadism, right? It's like, I was, you know, I, it, over the course of my life, I think I did the math one time I've lived in like 35 cities. And it, at one point, I mean, probably at the age of 30, I had never stayed in a house for more than like 18 months. And, uh, many times <laughs> it was like a couple months. Um, so, uh, you know, I was, I was exhausted uh, and a yeah. piece of that was, um, just not like when I lived in Tampa originally from 2012 to 2017, I got super plugged in, um, and had a ton of friends and was really involved in the business and the startup community. And, and, uh, you know, Tampa at the time, Tampa's changed a lot, but at the time, like you'd sit in a coffee shop in downtown Tampa and every other person that walked in the door, you would know. Um, mm. and uh, on the one hand, I really valued that. But on the other hand, I was like, if I don't leave and go travel, like I'm going to get really comfortable and never leave. Um, and I think everywhere I went, I was trying to kind of recreate that community. Um, and, and over the course of my travels, recognize that like the only way to really recreate that is to like be in one place um, and, and to really have a community and a, and a great group of like IRL friends and, um, you know, to do to do uh, work that impacts the community, whether that's with your business and or kind of nonprofit volunteer work, like you, you have to sit still for some time. Um, so I had planned on doing that in Miami and then life happened. And, and uh, you know, I, I sort of was like, I have this amazing network already in Tampa that I've built. Um, it's a, it's a solid place to live. It's comfortable it, at the time was more affordable than it is now. Um, you know, why don't we go back there and, and try to build a life where, you know, maybe I travel, often, but not full time. Um, you know, I met this guy during my travels and he asked me, he's like, where do you park your skis? And I was like, I, I don't. <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I don't own skis and I don't park anything anywhere. And he was like baffled by this. And he was like, well, surely you like, you go back somewhere. And I was like, not really, man. Like, and, uh, I, I kind of have grabbed onto that concept of like, you know, maybe it's time to have somewhere to park your skis. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still travel often. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I work on the side of the business that doesn't really require me to be in the facilities all that often. Um, but to kind of round out this point, it's funny. And my, uh, my girlfriend just took her remote job for the first time and she's traveling a lot. She's like, you know, let's just go, let's go to here. Let's go there. And I'm like, I have three businesses we're working on within 15 miles of here. Like I can't really just drop everything and leave every other weekend with you. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a contrast, but I'm I'm enjoying kind of like building in a in a place again. Yeah, yeah, no, there, it, it's it's very different. Um, but it just makes you realize, and I think this is this kind of some wisdom comes from this that um, t total complete unfettered freedom um, has its has it has its appeal, no doubt, but also has its limits. Um, you can fatigue of it, and you and you also are sacrificing things. You're you're, you're often the things that require. Um, commitment are also the things that are rewarding. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, you, we can, we can apply this not only to digital nomadism, but to marriage, to, you know, business, to yep. building a community, friends, you know, all of it. Um, so very interesting. Yeah. It's like a, a very clear example is like one of the things I've wanted to do forever is like work with, uh, work mentor, a, a high school kid. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and if you try to do that through like big brothers, big sisters or any similar organizations, like they require you to say, I'm going to be in this place for a year. And if you talk to anyone that's done that, they're like, you know, I started working with this kid when he was 14 and it took me a year to build a connection. And then another three to four years to like really work with him to grow and foster that. And it's just like, you can't do that type of work 
um, if you're constantly moving. Like dating was the same totally. thing. It's like I would go on a date with someone in Berlin and they'd be like, oh, like, what do you do? I'm like, you know, I travel. And they're like, when are you leaving? I'm like, I don't know, tomorrow. And like, it's not very appealing. Yep. Um, so yeah, at, at the same time, I bought I bought two doggy daycares, a house, and, and uh, I have a, a very serious girlfriend and a dog now. So I'm like, very very here <laughs> you swing from extremes to extremes taylor it seems uh, yeah i tend to do that okay Let, before we before we leave this topic which i could talk for a lot longer about but um we want to get into the, the the nuts and bolts of your business um just tell me of the these 35 cities or at least the cities that you lived in during this nomadic period um top two favorite two i love berlin um I spent uh, a lot of time studying German. I'm kind of like a World War II history buff, mm. and, and uh, um, that coupled with like Berlin is one of the more progressive cities in the world. I think um, you can really let any freak flag yep. that you could fly fly there, um, and uh, it's also like a hideously ugly city architecturally, but just like the people and the art, and um, it's a it's very full of contrasts, and and uh, it's also a place that like gives me a lot of hope. Um, because if you look at pictures of it in 1945, it was essentially decimated. And then it spent the next you know, 40 years split in two between communism and, and, and capitalism. And, and, uh, you know, you go there today and it's, it's, it's awesome and progressive. And, and, uh, um, you know, I wrote an essay about this, but like you see situations like what's happening in Ukraine and, and, and with Russia right now. And it's like, you know, humanity comes back. Uh, mm. you know, we, we do these terrible things to ourselves, but, but you go to a city like Berlin and you're like, you know, there's, there's always hope. Um, and, and, uh, will evolve and change. And, and Berlin reminds me of that. Um, and then in the U S, um, I, I really enjoyed living in LA. I spent about an, a year there. Um, I lived on, uh, just off Venice beach. Um, the weather's like unprecedented. It's, it's always perfect. Um, there's enough going on. Um, but it's not like overwhelming. It's not like a New York or even a San Francisco where you're like super urban. Um, but it definitely has a lot of downsides. I mean, like the homelessness thing is pretty crazy. Uh, living in California is expensive. Um, but the tech community is great there too. I mean, there's yeah. definitely like an entrepreneurial thread that, that really lives in LA, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great choices. Yeah. Berlin. I went for the first time in 20, first and only time in 2017, but, um, I was also coming kind of coming off of a world war two, um, binge of audiobooks and, uh, just ate it up there for three or four days. Um, but you're right. I mean, you could, you could just go there and just focus on the 1940s, um, and eat for days on that. Um, but it's important to just keep very much in view what Berlin has become and what it is today, which is an incredibly dynamic, yeah. artistic, progressive, exciting, uh, town. I mean, what a great place. Um, so yeah, it's very cool. All right. Do back to doggy daycares now. Um, okay. So all of the stuff that we were talking about, the opportunity in ETA, did, did, uh, and, and how, you know, the bringing in best, best practices from tech and from, you know, more forward industries, did your, uh, seller, were, were, was all that low hanging fruit there? Who was your seller? Yeah. So the first seller, um, he was actually, uh, it's kind of a fun story. He was a, also a tech entrepreneur. He'd started um, a couple companies. He'd had an exit and and sort of between his last exit and like his next tech venture, he decided his, his wife and him love dogs and he thought there was a gap in the market in Tampa. So they decided to sort of start uh, the business that we ended up acquiring um, with the focus of being like absentee owners and this thing would just cash flow and they would do their thing. And um, so he had set up a lot of, systems that we still use. Um, the business model is very similar. Um, we haven't really changed the brand at all. Um, so he was, he's more of an engineer than I am. Um, so there were some instances where he kind of over engineered some things where we came in and kind of dialed and simplified them back. Um, but what we saw and what got us kind of really excited about the acquisition is, is, um, you know, I, I can look at the business from from the side I just described, and then my partner can really look at the business from the, the the operation side of like, how are they moving dogs? How are they managing dogs? How many dogs can they fit in a facility? Um, and I felt like there was enough to build on uh, with what he created on kind of the branding and the marketing side. And my partner was like, there's a ton we can improve on um, with, with the way that we can manage dogs and how many dogs we can fit in this facility. Um, so when we took over, um, you know, a lot of searchers will kind of say, and you'll see this online of like, you know, don't do anything for, you know, 90 days, right. week hot. We were like, 
Um, you know, we immediately gave all the employees raises. Uh, we do that every time we do an acquisition. And I always tell that to people is like, if you want to win some goodwill, especially with hourly employees, like give them a dollar raise right away um, and tell them that the expectation is going to change. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, really honed in on kind of normalizing a lot of the pricing um, and the communications with the customers. Um, he had built out kind of a, a semi custom uh like full ERP system almost that was like it had CRM, it had marketing automation, it had all the accounting software. Um, and we scrapped that pretty, pretty shortly after the acquisition because it was going to be a, a heavy development cost. And um, I've just done enough software development to know that like I didn't want to manage that. So we sort of brought in um, off the shelf uh, tech solutions to, to support that, which we're continuing to evolve. Um, and then, yeah, on the on the operations front, I mean, we I think my partner spent a little bit more time kind of watching how they were doing things, but pretty quickly um, changed the the way that we work with the dogs pretty dramatically. Um, and that enabled us to double the capacity uh, within the first six months of, of that facility. Wow. Well, I want to hear about that. But first, um, you know, it's funny because we were talking about the sellers and the fax machines and the lack of best practices and stuff. Here you are. Your first acquisition is from a guy who is entrepreneurial, a proven entrepreneur, probably on the younger side, I assume, yep. or he's not, you know, he's not looking at retirement. Um, so, you know, a savvy builder operator and so tech savvy that he actually developed custom <laughs> software for his business. So really the other, the, the, the complete like reverse of what, of, of that kind of boomer non-tech stereotype. Um, and yet still, even with a seller like that, you found lots of opportunity in there to go in and, and, um, and, and, and improve things quickly. So doubling revenue in six months because of kind of how you reshifted, basically you, you increased the number of dogs that you can, you can accept at any given time. Talk us through that. Yeah. So, uh, some of that's a bit of our secret sauce, but I mean, basically when, when we look at, a lot of doggy daycares are started by people that love dogs, like like this couple, right? Um, and my partner, uh, his name's Mike. Uh, he's an amazing guy, one of my closest friends, and uh, he spent ten years working with, you know, in a ten thousand square foot facility with hundreds of dogs a day, um, and he was trained in in one of the bigger franchise systems. So that type of experience, I think, is is really hard to get on your own. Um, so again, most of the acquisition targets we look at are, are you know, a, a couple or someone who's obsessed with dogs says, Hey, I'm going to rent a space and I'm going to start a doggy daycare. And they kind of just wing it. Um, and you get to a point where, you know, more than 30, 40, 50 dogs, uh, and, and you really kind of got to know what you're doing and you got to figure out how to move them safely through the facility. You got to train staff to manage them safely. Um, uh, and they just didn't have that experience. So we kind of came in and, and, and really just sort of upped the, the, the standard of care, I think. Um, which enabled us to bring in a lot more dogs safely. Because what ends up happening is if you can manage, you know, 50 or 60 dogs sort of by the seat of your pants, uh, you can't do that with 150 dogs. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's closer to kind of the scale that we have today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay. And, you know, when you had said the thing about um, how people in online say, you know, don't change anything for 90 days or six months or whatever. And you guys came in and started changing things very quickly. Um, I will just point out that I, I think when people say don't don't touch anything, don't, you know, until you really learn it's because you have three, six months of learning to do, because in many cases you've acquired into an industry that you may not really know much about yeah. at all. Um, and, but you guys, you know, via your partner have 10 years of operating experience. So there there is that important differentiator in, in the two of you. Yeah. And I think, I think what we did that we changed on both sides of the business. Um, and I think we, we do a pretty good job of kind of like staying in our lanes. Right. So like if I were coming in as a sole acquirer, right, like I probably wouldn't have done anything different on the dog ops for a while, but I would have changed the marketing and the communications and some yeah. of the pricing and the business model, like pretty, pretty, cause I, I, I've done that for 10 years. Right. Um, I think, similar to him, like if he would have done this on his own, he would have come in and sort of left the marketing and communications and everything as it was and changed the, the safety standards and, and the way he was training and handling staff right away. Um, so I, I think that uh, if you know how to do something better than what the prior owner was doing, like don't hesitate to do it better. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, 
Taylor, tell us if you can, whatever you can about the size of the business, any numbers that you can share. So the, we're still in the first acquisition. You keep, I keep referring to your acquisition, but you've done two. But we're talking about the first one. So what can you share about um, size? Yeah. So when we bought that, uh, we paid uh, you know high six figures for it, um, roughly three and a half times uh, you know net income, SD, EBITDA, sort of however you want to slice that. Um, and our, our initial goal, uh, was to get that to seven figures in the first year. Um, and we got the run rate there probably in five months. Um, and we'll, we'll do probably two and a half times that number this year in the second year we've owned it. Wow. Phenomenal. Um, from that one location or partly because you've made the second acquisition? No, from that, from that one location. Wow. Uh, two and a half times the original revenue or two and a half times the seven figure, two and a half times the original, Phenomenal. two and a half times the original revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Just probably just shy, probably 2.2. 2. That's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, I, and, and the thing that's interesting about dog daycare and this is sort of yeah. how we think about it, right. Is, is, um, uh, the facilities have a cap, right? The, the closest, the closest, uh, um, comparison is self storage, right. Where you can only, you can only sort of get so much revenue out of a space. You can only fit so many dogs into a location. Um, so we get to a point with these facilities where it's like, unless we start adding additional services on top, like they're, they're kind of capped out. Um, so now we're baking that into to sort of our model and our thesis of like, okay, if we can go in and we can buy these locations that we, and we think we can increase the capacity, that's where there's a huge opportunity for us. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like what it would be for you guys, and maybe this is what you just said, essentially, but it, like you, you, you now have a playbook to let's call it double or more than double kind of the, the, the people who, the, the, the operators who don't have this insight that you guys did about how you can really increase the, the scale of a particular facility. Um, so you just go around Florida and, you know, neighboring markets looking for similarly kind of like undersized facilities or under, under, um, you know, monetized, uh, for lack of a better term facilities and you acquire them and that, and that's how, and, and then you, you take your model into these, you know, into 10 and 20 and 30 acquisitions. Is that basically what you plan to do for the next few years? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been the goal. I think finding those targets is, as we, I think we got, uh, we haven't quite figured out why, but I think we got a little lucky with the speed. We were able to do the first two. Um, oh. You know, we've been running a pretty active search for the last, uh, for the last almost year. Um, and it's, it's been harder to find uh, targets in sort of the geographic focus we've had. Um, and I think that's frankly just because everybody got dogs during COVID and the businesses are doing well. Um, so we've been sort of branching out from that strategy a bit. Um, and we've definitely looked at some units where it's very clear we can't, improve top line revenue or not by much anyway that like hey these are very well run um you know they've kind of maxed out their capacity and, and you know maybe we can eke a little bit more out of it but you know at that point it really becomes hey are we just are we adding even to, to the bottom line um by by bolting this on um but that's also why we decided to build one we're figuring hey you know maybe if we can't find these acquisition targets maybe we just go build our own um so yeah we're continuing to kind of pursue additional acquisitions but also you know very creatively thinking about other ways we can grow so, so business number three, your third business that you've you're building in three years is another one of these, but from the but a, a ground up. Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a, where, a pre existing warehouse that we're kind of building out. Um, we don't buy the real estate, so we look for kind of good long term leases. Um, and uh, you know, found a good landlord, good location, and and uh, we're actually submitting the uh, paperwork for the building permits today. Um, so that's, it's, you know, fully designed at this point and, and now we're just kind of dealing with, with the politics to get it done. Cool. Cool. And what is the name of your, uh, for people watching on video, they'll see your t-shirt, but for those listening on audio, what is the name of your, of your business? It's a uh, pause and rec letter N rec. Pause pause, and rec. You can check us out on pause and rec.com. Cool. Um, going back to the size of the first acquisition. So you said you, you acquired it for high six figures. So for easy math, let's call that a million dollars. It was less than a million dollars, but let's say a million dollars, three and a half, uh, three and a half multiple. So that's what three hundred thousand dollars in SDE. Um, you, you don't have to give me the exact number, but the point is, if it's in that range, um, that's a that you know that's a pretty small acquisition, particularly for for partners. So you're splitting, you know, let's call it three hundred thousand dollars of SDE between the two of you. 
um, just to kind of get to a normal tech salary. Uh, and that leaves nothing left over to invest. So how did you, how did you get comfortable with, with a relatively small acquisition, particularly with a partner uh, uh, when you're doing this partner? Yeah, I mean, I think the piece we sort of left out is like the partnership journey Mike and I had, which is 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 worth talking about. But you know, we we um, we've been friends for a long time. I mentioned we were roommates, um, uh, and when we were living together, he was he started working at uh, this doggy daycare as like an interim job. Just didn't want to work in an office. Was trying to figure out what to do with his life, um, and the. G or the owner there, they, they changed ownership hands right after he started. Um, and it was pretty distressed. And the, the new owner that came in was kind of known in that franchise system for uh, turning facilities around. Um, and she recognized that Mike was you know, a smart guy and, and she made him the GM. Um, so over the next couple of years, like he turned the facility around with her, um, but she was fully absentee. So he would see her like twice a year and would talk to her on the phone kind of once a week. Um, and I'm running the software company. So we're coming home every day and I'm comparing notes about, you know, managing all these crazy engineers. And he's telling me about managing all these 21 year old dog obsessed people. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of like, you know, uh, master classing, if you will, like yeah. our, our separate business problems. And I was just super impressed with like what he had built and, and, uh, and, and frankly felt like he was underpaid. Um, and had always told him for years, like, Hey, whenever you're ready, like, let's, let's figure out how to do this for you. So the, so the first acquisition was like, yeah, like let's do this. But it was much more from my standpoint, like, I don't know if I'm going to do this full time. It was like, let's, let's, let's set Mike up with a job and, and a piece of a company that he owns, um, and something that I can be involved in. But, but we kind of went into it being like, this may be the only one and mm. maybe we'll do more, maybe we'll grow. Um, but let's see how this goes. Um, so we weren't really. I mean, we evaluated the acquisition more from the standpoint of looking at like what the franchise comps were. So we kind of knew what it would cost to build um, uh, the franchise units that we were thinking about. Yeah. Uh, and this was this fit in that range. Um, and the SDE was frankly roughly 10% higher because we didn't have franchise fees. Um, so when I, yeah, when we bought it, it was like I, I wasn't full time. So it didn't really need to support me. Um, and then when we bought the second one, um, that was when we made the decision. And when we also had the, we had the financials. Now we had paid doubled revenue on the first one and, and, uh, um, you know, had the additional income coming in from the second one that we also thought we could double that it, that it, it made sense for us to both to be involved. Great. Well, it makes more sense. And so now tell us please about the second acquisition, whatever you can on size numbers and so on. Yeah. So the second acquisition was, um, you know, about double the first, um, in in most with most metrics like double the size physically um you know double the the uh uh the sale price um you know a little bit less we paid we paid a higher multiple uh for the second one the the seller uh kind of knew that that there was a lot of potential there um and uh you know pu pushed us a little harder there um but we we felt the second one was sort of closer to the type of facility that we wanted from a real estate standpoint. So we were willing to pay a little bit more for it. Um, and it, it kind of solidified geographically, like owning a very specific piece of Tampa that we wanted. So um, we have kind of like the core of, of, of Tampa covered um, with those two locations. Um, and that growth has been uh, also awesome. It hasn't been quite as fast as the first one, um, but it's, it's trending to be, you know, around two X within the first kind of 18 months based off of, uh, what we paid for it. And, and is that thanks to the same tweak, that same kind of figuring out how to it, it go from 50 to 150 dogs, not those numbers exactly, but really increasing the, your, you know, your, your supply basically. Yeah, I think there, the, the issues were, um, were different. Um, we, uh, we rebranded that one um, and we had some kind of brand equity that we had built up with the first one. Um, so I think that helped. Um, I think the location is um, the first one we bought is like right near downtown Tampa. It's like the, the core of our customer base, like really lives very close. It's super convenient. Um, we usually have long wait lists to get in there because of that. Uh, the second one is not as convenient, but there's a lot of growth happening kind of in and around that area. So we sort of knew that this might be a little bit of a slower, slower ramp than the first one was. Um, yeah, but it was a similar playbook. I mean, it was, it was, we had sort of learned on the first one. So I think we were a bit 
more efficient with with sort of how we handled the transition. But it was different because the rebranding effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The brand equity from the first. And and, and the thing that's nice, like the thing that's nice about doing it again, and and I just wrote an article for Baton about kind of the idea of platform acquisitions is. Um, you, you have a playbook, right? Like you figure it out on the first one and then, you know, we didn't have to figure out which software to use. We didn't have to figure out how to communicate this to the customers. We didn't figure out how to, tr- how to transition the business model or increase price. Like we'd already done all of that. Um, so we're literally like pulling out the same email templates. Um, and at this point now we've kind of documented all of that. So if we buy another one tomorrow, like it's even easier than the first one was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just explained how, how you uh, arrived at the, the first acquisition and kind of the size and it only needed to support your partner and so on. Um, and it was a small acquisition, smaller than the conventional wisdom should says that you should buy. Um, but given what you just said about the, the benefits of just you know having done one acquisition and how that makes number two and three and four easier, do you have any thoughts about buying big versus buying small? Like knowing what you know now, having been a small business operator and being more sophisticated just about ETA broadly, um, do you subscribe to this this wisdom that you should you know a serious searcher should only target you know seven hundred thousand uh, in SDE and above? I think, I think it depends on like what your goal is. And like, I think one of the things that we, I I see often is, is, is this sort of like private equity mentality of like, I'm going to buy this thing. I'm going to grow it and I'm going to flip it. Um, uh, that's definitely not where we're coming at it from. Um, and we're sort of trying to draw the line between like, are we building a lifestyle business or are we building something that, you know, has real enterprise value long term? Um, and, uh, I think that's kind of an interesting place to be. Uh, I think if you're like, if your goal is, Hey, I want to buy a business, I want to spend three to five years on it. And then I want to sell it to a bigger PE firm. Like, yeah, buy something big. Um, if your goal is like, you want to sort of buy yourself a job that has growth potential, uh, I would focus less on the size of the acquisition and more on why you're uniquely positioned to grow it. Excellent. Um, we are pushing up on time here, Taylor, but I still have a bunch of things I want to ask you. Um, let's see <laughs> in no particular order, going back to how you found that, that your first acquisition, um, that was basically, you were plugged into the kind of, you'd already been looking at some of the franchises and in that, doing that research, you found the opportunity that you did, or how did you find it? Yeah, it was basically like through that research, we kind of heard through the grapevine that uh, that this place was potentially thinking about selling. Um, and uh, we just reached out, we just kind of cold reached out to them and they were like, yep, we have all the financials package. We're talking to buyers and you can come see it next week. Um, so from kind of initial outreach to close was probably 90 days max. Um, the second one was we actually had another target under LOI between the first and the second um, that we walked away from um, because we couldn't we couldn't make the uh, the relationship with the pre existing landlord work mm. um, so that was definitely a learning of like hey as we're going through this uh, you know get the landlord involved earlier uh, if needed because yeah that fell apart there which was a bummer for the the seller. Um, but uh, yeah, the second one was, again, it was actually one of our investors. He used to go there and he kind of knew the owner. Um, and, uh, you know, there's only so many daycares in Tampa and, and we were kind of hyper-focused in, in Tampa at that point. Um, so we were really just kind of calling locally and he had a relationship with this guy from when he used to take his dog there and called him up and said, hey, you know, we're buying these these places. Do you have any interest in selling? And, and uh, with him, the negotiations took a little bit longer. I think we started talking in August. Um, and we closed like mid November. So yeah, probably 120 days with him. Yeah. Yeah. Still great. You know, interesting that you have, that you found acquisition two and then almost, you know, another one in Tampa that didn't ultimately pan out, but that you had these two really hot, like really warm deals. One of which came to fruition in Tampa in, you know, quickly. And yet, um, you know, finding other opportunities subsequent to that has been difficult. So it seemed like you were probably, yeah, you've probably been a little disappointed because you were probably like all this TAMP activity. You were oh, like, yeah, we're going we to be, like, we're we're be able to stamp gonna this get, thing you know, out. Yeah. 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 It's uh, definitely that. I mean, I, I think, I think part of it was COVID, right? I think when we were looking in 20 and then even 21, um, people hadn't fully rebounded, right? Like 
like the first two valuations we had to do, I mean, you're looking at like 2019 financials and then you're looking at 20, 2020 was a wall. Everyone's like, we're not, you know, we're not selling if you want to value it on 2020. Um, and, and frankly, they were right. Like you, you're seeing top line revenue cut in more than in half at most of these places. Um, uh, but in 21, you're starting to see it really creep back up and kind of normalize. Um, so yeah, I think we sort of hit the timing, right? I wish we would have had, you know, a $15 million search fund in, in the summer of 2020, because you probably could have bought a lot of them then. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think now, I mean, the ones that are well run or, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're making money. And I mean, there's, there's, there's a multi-unit, uh, not far from my house that I would love to acquire. And, uh, we've talked to her a few times and she's like, you know, I'm making money. Why would I sell? Yeah. Um, so I think, and, and that, I mean, we, we have a, a great M&A advisor that works with us and, and, you know, what we hear from him and others is like, if you're, if you're playing the long game, just, you know, every six months, reach out, you never know what happens. Yep. Um, and we're starting to even see a little bit of that where people will change their minds, um, after some time. The fact that you, some of the first opportunities that you looked at, but didn't end up going with were franchises, but ultimately you bought this independent. Um, any thoughts on on buy, in, f- through the perspective of ETA, buying a franchise versus buying an independent? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, like we really had both pieces of the puzzle. And, and we talk about this all the time. It was like, if, if Mike was going to do this on his own, I think he would have benefited from the franchise structure just in terms of having help with the marketing and the finances and figuring out how to fund it um, and uh, talking to a good, healthy franchise system from that perspective, I think is great. Um, and then even from my standpoint, it's like if I was super obsessed with dogs and wanted to do a doggy daycare and I had all this business experience, but like really didn't know how to work with a hundred dogs in a, in a location or how to build a doggy daycare. Um, I think they can add a lot of value there. Um, but I would really look at like, what is the franchise providing? And in the daycare space, like they don't really have the, the, the halo McDonald's effect where you really are buying like this massive brand. Um, and most of them will charge you a marketing fee that like, is that really benefiting you? Um, especially on the, on the local business side. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting. I mean, there's, there's plenty of case studies of people that have like rolled up a lot of franchisees and, and, and made, made money doing that. Um, but we're both pretty creative and entrepreneurial and we just kind of wanted to run our own thing. Cool. The, at the risk of uh, encouraging other people to get into your space, uh, assuming I'm, I'm in California or in Virginia or in Maine. Um, is this, is this uh, an interesting space that I should be looking at? If you have a mic, if you don't have a mic, don't do it. Yeah. Like there's, there's, I think there's no way that we could be anywhere near as successful. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't run one of these facilities by myself. Um, not at, not at scale. Um, so it's, 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 and I think that's been an interesting lesson for me personally, just sort of, as we look at, um, you know, the rest of my career and, you know, do we do this again with other businesses? It's like, know your lane and don't be afraid to kind of, find someone in another lane that can really support you and, and work with you as a partner. Um, because I think, again, we complement each other really well where it's like, we can't grow without each other. Um, and we trust each other. We have a, a relationship we've built over time. So yeah, I mean, I look, we look at, at groups all the time. I mean, even some of the big franchisees and we're like, you know, how are they, how are they going to be able to manage, you know, multiple locations with, without the experience of, of working with dogs for years. So, um, yeah, I mean, and don't compete with me because we want to buy them all. <laughs> no, it, it really does sound like, um, it, you know, one of the things that's talked about in ETA is, and you kind of you, you said it yourself, like figuring out where you, f- the, it's a puzzle, right? And look, and you're up one puzzle piece and, and the business that you acquire is the other puzzle piece and you want two pieces that, you know, that fit, like, you know, like pu- puzzle pieces need to. And in your case, it was kind of like, three puzzle pieces. I mean, you and Mike are very complimentary. You already had, but you know, a lot of partners say that they have complimentary skill sets, but you also had 10 years of friendship uh, and history that you could lean on. So you had, you know, trust that you can't accelerate. It was just, you know, it was baked into the yeah. 10 years. It's invaluable. Um, 
and then um you know and then and then seeing an opportunity in pets and him having all this operational experience so it was really an alignment of a, a, a lot of different stars um to make this all come together so pretty cool Last question for you, Taylor. Um, one of the things that um, my audience is telling me I need to um, be asking more is about the reality of small business life and small business operations. And, um, you know, uh, 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 those of us who are kind of in ETA media, <laughs> to the extent that such a thing exists, um, are really excited about the opportunity uh, uh, that ETA and that Search provides. Um, but um, sometimes lose sight of the fact that like running a small business is not glamorous. Uh, you, I want to, so I want to ask my guests this question more often, but you in particular, because you're also coming from the aforementioned, you know, nomadic glory and cushy tech. Um, so, so like, I feel like you more than a lot of people um, might really feel, you know, the, the slap in the face that can be small business ownership once you get in a seat. Your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think about this a lot, right? And like people warned me about it before I, I, you know, even my parents were like, you know, is this going to be able to like scratch your the intellectual side of your brain enough? Um, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's you know, I, I was documenting SDKs and APIs for augmented reality systems at my last job, right? Like, and and today I, I was handling a call because a dog broke a toe um, <laughs> and we're installing a fence. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a definitely the problem set is so different. Right. Um, and I think where I see a lot of people in small business get frustrated is where they don't, um, they don't spend enough time kind of working on, on the business in interesting ways. Right. So like I work in the business a decent amount, but Mike's really the one working in the business. That's his passion. That's what he's good at. Um, and I get to spend a lot of my time kind of working at a higher level kind of on the business. Um, so yeah, I think understanding that reality, right. Of like, are you, are you buying yourself a job and is it a job you want to do? Or is there enough bandwidth and kind of space in what you're acquiring where you can really, uh, kind of scratch some of the itches that you want. And I think the, the counterpoint to that, right. Is like, we, we get to have these, these much kind of deeper, richer, more meaningful relationships, I think with, with our employees and our coworkers and our customers, than um, you know, than I, than I got to have in tech, like, you know, I, I hardly ever met my customers at, at, at these tech startups I worked at. Now I go stand in my lobby at the end of the day and, you know, I meet all kinds of cool people in the community. And, um, you know, we have a, a, a staff member who has an issue and we can help her out and, you know, get to see how that impacts her life. And, and uh, that stuff is, is, is that, that brings meaning, right? Like, I think that's what I ultimately am I'm looking for now is like uh, less about like scratching an intellectual itch and is like, how do I create meaning in my own life and meaning mm -hmm. in the lives of others? And I think small business creates an amazing opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded of uh, when we, uh, I really address this question of kind of like the intellectual um, itch scratching and, and, and to the extent that it exists in small business uh, with the Chenmark. Are you familiar with the, the Chenmark folks? Uh, yeah, I listened to your your one about the uh, the they bought that boat tour company. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That so that yeah. was with one of the Chenmark partners, and then her husband yep. and partner and his brother were on an earlier episode from January, and um, and Palmer Higgins was talking about how yeah the 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 impact of Chenmark they have four hundred plus employees employees just really can't be overstated like that. Um, it, it's hard to articulate, but it's just very, very meaningful, um, uh, you know, impact because, you know, Elon Musk and tech and, you know, they, they will talk about impact in terms of kind of like number, number of lives touched, you know, like my widget is being used by 500,000 people. Um, and so in some respects, that's you're impacting 500,000 people, but in a very transactional software -y way. And I think what you and what Palmer are talking about is like, you know, in a, in a more human way. Um, and so maybe fewer people, but in a, in a way that really, you really feel the impact, which um, is ultimately what is ultimately the impact you want, the kind you feel. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I sort of felt like at the end of my time in tech, and I think part of it was like the, the, the layoff experience I went through was that like, I and everyone else involved in the ecosystem was essentially disposable, right? Like, uh, if one customer left, who cares? Like if, if one employee leaves, oh, well, um, if we have to lay off half the company, whatever. Um, 
you know, and I'm, I'm kind of overemphasizing, I think the lightness with which people do take, take those experiences. But, um, I, I felt like there was so much emphasis on the, on the, the macro that like we forgot about the micro mm. and like humanity lives in these micro interactions. Mm-hmm. We live in small communities, we live in family units and, and, um, uh, you know, small business really has an opportunity to kind of impact the micro. And, and, and I sort of have this thesis that like, if more smart people spent time working on the micro, like it would ratchet up to the macro in, in really amazing ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I look at what we get to do today in terms of, you know, especially with what we're trying to do with our staff and 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 trying to bring them tools and resources and career opportunities. Um, and it gets me really excited and, and, and again, kind of provides that meaning, I think, that I was missing in tech um, that uh, I'm excited to continue to, to, to try to build, you know, a, a, a company that, that uh, you know, can be very meaningful to, to people. Great. What a, what a perfect point to end on, Taylor. Really, really cool. Um, uh, how can people get in touch with you, ask you questions, give you feedback? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Taywall, uh, spelled like it sounds. Um, and yeah, I, I do a bunch of writing on uh, Baton Marketplace's blog, um, writing about a lot of the topics we've talked about today. So you go check some of that out. Um, they're doing uh, some interesting things with small business valuations. So G- give yeah. Baton a plug, Taylor. Yeah, so Baton is uh, essentially building the Zillow for SMB, uh, connecting buyers and sellers, but primarily through uh, providing free valuations to uh, any small business that, that wants to know what they think their business is worth. Um, so I, I constantly am getting approached by sellers of other businesses that are like, hey, can you help me figure out how I sell my you know online media company or my flower store? And uh, I point them to Baton, and in a couple of days, they have a valuation on their business, and Baton can help connect them with with buyers. So, if you're a searcher, Baton's another good place to go to uh, potentially find some some leads. And it's get getbaton.com, the URL. Uh, it's Baton BatonMarket.com. Okay, thanks a lot, sir. This has uh, been a really fun conversation. Thanks for um, sharing your experience, and um, let's have you back on in a year and, and hear what where, where Pause and Rec is at that point. Awesome. Hopefully, we got at least three more.